916. What a day that will be. All who have it. There is coming a day when no heartache shall come, no more clouds in the sky, no more tears to dim the eye. All is peace forevermore on that happy golden shore. What a dear, glorious day that will be. What a day that will be. When my dear, thus I shall see. And I look upon his face. The one who saved me by his grace. Who in he takes me by the hand and leads me through the promised land. What a dear, glorious day that will be. There'll be no sorrow there, no more burdens to bear, no more sickness, no more pain, no more parting over there, and forever I will be with the one who died for me. What a dear, glorious day that will be. What a day that will be. Who in my dear, thus I shall see. And I look upon his face, the one who saved me by his grace. Who in he takes me by the hand and leads me through the promised land. What a day, glorious day that will be. What a day that will be. Who in my Jesus I shall see, and I look upon his face, the one who saved me by his grace, who in he takes me by the hand and leads me through the promised land. Who what a day. Glorious day that will be. Let us pray. Dearly Father, we come to you as humble as we know how, dear Lord. Just come to you, dear Lord. Just thank you for allowing us to see another beautiful day, dear Lord. We thank you, dear Lord, for allowing us to come out and worship you, dear Lord, in spirit and truth, dear Lord. Dear Lord, and all the other parts of the service that we devoted to you, and you to you. Dear Lord, uh, we ask forgives any sins we might commit against you, dear Lord, uh, whether with our thoughts, words, or deeds, dear Lord. Just be with us, dear Lord, as we make these uh, decisions, as we walk this life, dear Lord, and we ask of your strength and your, uh, that we will guide us, that we make the right decisions that we come to that time. Dear Lord, we pray for those who are sick and the, and the afflicted, dear Lord, uh, especially those in the body, dear Lord. We ask that you be with them, um, touch them, uh, keep them, dear Lord. Uh, um, and bless them in the way that you see fit, dear Lord. And those who are uh, mourning this hour, dear Lord, of uh, individuals dying of the COVID-19 or just any other illness or just any death in the families, just be with those, just, just comfort those individuals um, that they may go through this while they're going through the trying time. Now, dear Lord, we pray as we get ready this, 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 um, to listen to the study, dear Lord, that the things that are said and heard, dear Lord, uh, edify us and that we may be able to edify others dear lord 
Dear Lord, we just ask this prayer in your son in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat> Good evening, saints. Good to be back with you again today and um, able to partake in another study of God's holy and divine word. We appreciate everyone that made it out on tonight. And we're going to try to just jump right into it. It's about uh, 10 minutes after. And um, I wanted to just have you, uh, if you don't mind, uh, Brother Keith, um, uh, we're going to jump right into the slides, and uh, we're going to just read through them real quick, and then we'll talk about the uh, the lesson itself. We'll open it up and see if, if people have any uh, any thoughts. So we are in Acts chapter 19. Acts chapter is number 19, and we want to go to the text. The Bible says, And it came to pass that while Apollos was at Corinth, Paul, having passed through the upper coast, came to Ephesus, and finding certain disciples, he said unto them, Have ye received the Holy Ghost since ye believed? And they said unto him, We have not so much as heard whether they be in the Holy Ghost. And he said unto them, Unto what then were ye baptized? And they said, Unto John's baptism. Then Paul, then said Paul, John verily baptized with the baptism of repentance, saying unto the people that they should believe on him which should come after him, that is, on Christ Jesus. When they heard this, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. And when Paul had laid, hand, his, laid, when Paul had laid his hands upon them, the Holy Ghost came on them, and they spake with tongues and prophesied. And all the men were about twelve. And he went into the synagogue and spake boldly for the space of three months, disputing and persuading the things concerning the kingdom of God. When diverse were hardened and believed not, but spake evil of that way before the multitude, he departed from them and separated the disciples disputing daily in the school of one Tyrannus. And this continued by the space of two years, so that all they which dwelt in Asia heard the word of the Lord Jesus, both Jews and Greeks. I think I did go into reading up to verse number 11 and 12, but I want to just stop right there and just open up the discussion. If you have any thoughts or comments, there's probably going to be some things that we uh, will handle in this lesson, but there may be some other things that we're going to handle in sub subsequent lessons where those things become the emphasis of the text. Uh, for this particular lesson, we more focused on a few areas that we thought were only present in this text and may not carry over into other lessons. But there are some parts, if you were to keep reading into chapter 19, you're going to see even more uh, things that will progress into other, other portions of the lesson. I think now that I've just said what I said, <laughs> let me go over because I think I do want to read 11 and 12 because there was something else that happened <clears throat> that may come up tonight. So if I go to Acts 19, it's just not in the slide. <clears throat> And I look at Acts 16, 17, 18, 19, <laughs> uh, 11. And God wrought special miracles by the hands of Paul, so that from his body were brought unto the sick handkerchiefs or aprons, and the diseases departed from them, and the evil spirits went out of them. So that was verse 11 and 12. Just initially, any thoughts, uh, any recollection of where the Apostle Paul is and what's going on in his life? Was there any part of the lesson uh, that, uh, 
that spoke to you. And uh, we'll, let, let, let's start there if you guys want to do that. <clears throat> okay. In chapter 19, verse 9, mm -hmm. the reference of the way yes. that you had spoken of earlier, I know um, up until now, the way that this phrasing of the way mm -hmm. had often been talked about, or the ways that I'd heard it, was more so as like a reference to Christianity mm -hmm. in a sense. Mm -hmm. um, I hadn't ever heard of it in the way of that it's more of a lifestyle than a belief system mm -hmm. uh, because, mm -hmm. of course, you can believe something and not act on it, and that right. this was more so focused on the, on the fact that these people lived yes. in such a way yes. that you were able to tell who they were. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. And that, you know, that way that they lived was based upon Christ and that Christ is the way, and yes. if that is why it's called, if they were called like followers yes. of the way, the way, also differentiating in certain um, translations how way is capitalized as like yes. a we yes. are yes. a sect of people who are right. followers of right. like a particular person, right. um, which now makes more sense because in verse 9 where it says, um, that they were speaking evil of the way before mm -hmm. the congregation. So right. initially That's it's right. kind of like a, you know, the Christians are speaking evil of the Christians. Mm -hmm. Like they're making that distinction yes. was a little bit yes. more difficult. But then when you see it as a, no, the way were the people the who way. actually lived yes. away, not just those who called themselves believers. That's right. And that those who are calling themselves believers were like, mm -hmm. In my mind, those are who the congregation are, these are the ones who are being stubborn and whatnot, right. but the ones who are actually followers of the way yes. are those who lived in a way yes. that represented that they were following Christ. Amen, amen. I'm glad that you brought that out because when I was reading through the text and studying the text, I slowed down on that part too. Because what are they talking about? The way. Mm -hmm. You know, the, we know that the Christians were first called Christians in Antioch, that was back in Acts chapter 13. Uh, but then they had other terms for them. But when we notice in this text, they said they, they began to speak evil of the way. And actually, I think I have uh, a, a slide that speaks a little bit to that. They spoke evil of the way. And we were saying God is love. What does that mean? Jesus was not a part of the council culture of his day. He was the council culture of his day. When I, when I refer to that, it's, it's like he is the way. That's why we went to John 14, 6. <clears throat> and his way, his style, his preaching, the way the apostles were, the way they lived, it was not socially acceptable. Uh, it was not appealing to all manner of faiths and in, in, in doctrines or beliefs. It was not tolerant necessarily of other views. And that was predicated on what Christ said in John 14, 6, I am the way. And that's where that kind of connected with our text in Acts chapter number uh, 19, verse number 9, when they were speaking evil of the way. I, Christ said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father but by me. And then there's the seven I am statements that are in John's gospel. Uh, I am the bread of life. The bread sustains physical life, so Christ offers and sustains our spiritual life. I am the light of the world. To a world lost in darkness, Christ offers himself as a guide. I am the door of the sheep. Jesus protects his followers as shepherds protect their flocks from predators. I am the resurrection and the life. And we spent a little bit of time on that because there should be a difference in our life. When we have Christ or when Christ is in us or on us, there should be something different in our lives. So uh, I am the resurrection and the life, and death is not the final word for those in Christ. And there ought to be some joy in that. There ought to be some happiness in that. There ought to be some recognition of that. And then fifthly, I am the good shepherd. Jesus is committed to caring and watching over those who are his, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Obviously, that's our subject, John 14, 6. Jesus is the source of all truth and knowledge about God. 
And then the last one, number seven, I am the true vine. And uh, we would like to do an entire study on that one because that one uh, mixes in a lot of Old Testament concepts when you start looking at uh, what Jesus meant when he said true vine. We just read it in John 15, and we don't automatically connect with what Jesus was saying, but he was talking about Israel. He was talking about uh, the root of Jesse. And so we'll get into that when we start to study a little bit more in the, uh, on that specific topic. I think that's something that we're going we're gonna to be, uh, be looking at. But if we back up and we notice what's going on, the Apostle Paul comes and there's this group of people, approximately 12 or so, and he somehow, the Bible doesn't give us all these little details, and maybe they're not pertinent, but he somehow encounters them, and for some reason, he asks them a question. We don't know why, but for some reason, the concept or the question about them receiving the Holy Spirit, and we talked about the Greek preposition and um, in and on and, and with, you know, we kind of elaborated on that a little bit, but there was something, I don't want to say odd because I don't want to read into the text, but something prompted Paul to ask them. Something in Paul's mind, something that he saw, some prior conversation that the Holy Spirit did not record for us, but there was some interaction where Paul has a question. And that's right pretty much right at the top. And he says, verse 2, he said unto them, have ye received the Holy Ghost since ye believed? And so to me, it, 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 if we can, it drew to me how we know the fruit of the Spirit, Galatians chapter number 5. And so perhaps, and if you notice in the lesson today, I kept saying perhaps, perhaps, because the Bible doesn't say, and we don't want to add, but perhaps what Paul saw was he didn't see love. Perhaps what it was, he didn't see joy. Perhaps what it was, he didn't see peace. Perhaps what it was, he didn't see long suffering. He didn't see gentleness. He didn't see meekness. He didn't see temperance, which is self-control, all the fruit of the Spirit. So Paul uh, is, meets these people, and he's looking at the conduct of their lives, and Paul says, something's missing. Did you guys even hear? Did you, do you even know? Did you even hear about the Holy Spirit? Because I'm not seeing it in your life. I'm watching how you guys are still at each other's throats. I'm watching how you guys are not forgiving. I'm watching how you guys are mean to one another. I'm not seeing any love in, 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 in your interactions. Uh, you know, what, what were you baptized into? What, what, what's, what's going on here? Because what I see in your conduct does not reflect Christ and the working of the Holy Spirit. I don't see the Holy Spirit in you guys. So Paul asked this question, and I, I thought that once, because I've, I've read, we all, let me back up, we've all read this text a thousand times. Mm -hmm. But I don't know how many times we've asked a question, why did Paul ask the question? And so that's where we started to look at the Holy Spirit and what the Holy Spirit was doing. And again, the, these were taught, we believe, by Apollos. And we know that Apollos was an eloquent man. He was mighty in the scriptures. He was instructed in the way of the Lord. There's that same phraseology, Sister Leash. He was, being, he was uh, being fervent in the spirit, and he taught diligently, knowing only the baptism of John. And we notice that in John and Mark chapter number 1, verse number 4 and 5, that John's preaching was purely for repentance, and it was expressed only in baptism. But John's preaching was missing some key elements. Do you guys remember what it was? Resurrection. The resurrection, the cross, and the coming of the Holy Spirit. John's, John's baptism was what, John's preaching in the wilderness, which is, is fabulous when you study John. I mean, we haven't gone through John yet, but he's on our list. <laughs> it's fabulous when you see the life of John. I think John... Uh, was uh, 
you know, just a, a very powerful character in, in a sense like Paul, but he was missing a few things. And then, not to go too far into last week's lesson, but how did we correlate what John was preaching with the gospel of Christ Jesus? Do you guys remember it all? You could just take a shot if you don't remember. How did we correlate John's preaching or the baptism of repentance with New Testament teaching or what we understand to be the New Testament teaching? If you, if you don't know, just take a shot. If not, we'll kind of just dive into it. We gave, we gave a couple of scriptures. Number one, and this goes back to us trying to find where does the New Testament, I mean the Old Testament teaching end. If you ever want to ask yourself that, it says, well, we have the Bible, we have the Old Testament, New Testament, but where, where does it end? Luke 16, 16. Luke 16, 16. Jesus said the law and the prophets were until, key word, until John. Since then, the what is being preached. The kingdom is being preached, and every man presseth into it. So the law and the prophets being preached until John. Now, the second place we went to, and there was a word in there called tetelestai. You guys remember that? That's John 19, verses number 30. It's one of the seven last sayings of Christ. Christ is on the cross. If you ever, if you haven't, some denominational people, they do the seven last sayings. You know, it's, it's a good study. But one of them before he gave up the ghost was, it is finished. Yeah. And that word finished is to tell us that. So we have to ask ourselves, Jesus, what are you talking about? What's finished? If it's finished, it's finished. What, what's finished? You go back and look at all the prophetic record, look at all the things that were prophesied about the anointed one in the Old Testament. Those things have been fulfilled once he gave up the ghost, and then obviously he goes through it and he is resurrected. So those two texts kind of mark for us spiritually where we could say the Old Testament law or that, that system being transferred into Christ because now the kingdom the kingdom is here. And of course, we know Romans 10, 4, and that we could not be, be saved by the law. If you go over to the book of Romans <clears throat> and take a look at chapter number 10, verse number 4, Paul says, for Christ is the what of the law? That word is teleos. And you will find it only approximately because it's one or two, it's either 32 or 33 times, Brother Tony. I looked it up. <laughs> you only find it either 32 or 33 times in all the Bible. And whether you have a thought for thought translation, which is a liberal one, or if you have a word for word translation, no matter what translation type, King James, Young's Living Translation, NASB, all of them are consistent in interpreting teleos, because some words, the meaning is derived from the context. All of them are consistent in Romans chapter 10, verse number 4, as translating teleos as end, as in finished, done, complete, over, period, no more. There's one or two places where teleos can be translated as goal. But again, that's context dependent. So those would be three scriptures, Luke 16, 16, John 19, 30, and then you would go to Romans 10, 4. The problem we have with Christians is that we stop reading. Once we get to Romans 10, 4, we read the first half, but we don't read the second half. So the second half of Romans 10, 4, Christ is in, the first half says, for Christ is the end of the law. The second half is for righteousness. 
So that's why where my brother, you were, you were showing me the video where he was talking about the law and if people wanted to do certain things, they can do those things, but it is not for righteousness. If, if you want to, you know, and that's what Paul, well, Paul we see this when uh, last two weeks ago or last week when he took the vow. And the reason why we stopped there is because when we get, I think it's the Acts 24, we were talking about that outside today, he's going to take another one. And, and, and people are always thrown off by that. They say, wait, 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 Paul's keeping the law. No, 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 no. Understand what Paul is doing. Paul is living out what he told the Corinthians. To the Jew, I became a Jew. To the Greek, I became a Greek. I became all things to all men so that I might win a few. And we were saying, that doesn't mean you can go up there and start, you know, popping pills and, you know, shooting up drugs. That's not what, it's, what he's saying. But what he's saying is that whether it was Timothy needed to be circumcised or not circumcised, whether he needed to take a vow so that he can gain access to the, to the, uh, to the temple back in Jerusalem, whatever he needed to do to get in to preach the gospel, he was willing to do it, provided it didn't conflict with the word of God. But Jim. I was just going to hit on what we talked about. I, I asked that question, Paul, Paul, was Paul trying to keep the law when he was saying it? We try to keep the law, but, you know, he was... It was hard keeping the law. Um, so then I asked you, well, he should be doing Christ's law, not the law of Moses. So you're going to explain that. You, oh. you, kind of, you kind of touched on it right then. Yeah, but, yeah, yeah. That was when we were making reference in Romans chapter 7, Romans chapter number 8. Uh, we would probably have to go into those a little bit further. But Paul was talking about, you know, he saw the law as good. You know, in other words, anything coming from God is good. In other words, Paul was recognizing, hey, the law is good. Thou shalt not kill, thou shalt not steal, thou shalt not covet, thou shalt not bear false witness against thy neighbor, thou shalt not do these things. And we're out here in this wilderness, there's 400,000 people or 200, whatever the number is. Uh, there's sanitary laws, there's dietary laws, there's, there's laws when, when, when people get sick and injured. The law is good, but it was not designed for salvation. It was designed to do what? To show us what? Sin. sin. Paul said, I wouldn't even have known of some of these things if it were not for the law. So in that context, he was saying that the law was good. But then he said, but there's another law. <laughs> and these, these two laws, this is the law of his flesh. And that's all in Romans chapter number seven, where Paul starts to, starts to talk, about, uh, talk about that. But when we went on to our lesson, let me go to the next slide, because we saw something here. <clears throat> Let's just read this again. Paul, having passed through the upper coast, came to Ephesus, and finding certain disciples, sent unto them, have received the Holy Ghost since ye believe. And they said, well, we have not so much as heard, if there be any Holy Ghost. And he said unto them, what then were ye baptized? And they said, unto John's baptism. Then uh, said Paul, John verily baptized with the baptism of Jesus, saying the people that they should believe on the one who's come after him, that is on Christ Jesus. When they heard this, when they heard this, they got rebaptized. Is that what your Bible said? Mm. It don't say rebaptized. They had already been baptized, it says. Mm. It don't say they were rebaptized. It says they were baptized. In other words, they had. Uh, the correct teaching, the correct understanding. They were able to look at what their lives were, and they heard Paul clarify or teach more excellently the teaching of Apollos. And they said, well, wait a minute. We actually haven't been, <laughs> we haven't been baptized. Brother Paul, let's, we want to be baptized. Amen. And so whenever you have people that, uh, that have that, and, and they, they have those questions. You can come right here. And to be perfectly honest, brethren, this was one of the texts that caused me many, 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 many years ago, Brother Tony, to look at my life and ask myself, what then was I baptized into? And once I learned and I studied, I said, okay, I need to be baptized. And I was baptized right here in that same cold water. <laughs> So that's, we wanted to just make that point because I think that's a, this is a, this is a doctrinal issue, not so much that we want to argue with anyone about it. We're not about that, but we just want to look at what the Word of God says 
and do our very, very best to try to understand, interpret, and teach what we see in the text. And that's what we're doing. But Tony. And I, but this was going back to your earlier scriptures, uh, when he said, we know that it said Paulus was in Corinth. Mm -hmm. We already talked about Apollos. We talked about him, you know, pretty much being incomplete. Yes. And so it lets us know that Paul is down in Ephesus, that it said he came, he finding certain disciples. Yes. For something, you know, so he took them as followers. Yes. But yes. as you said, somewhere in that conversation or whatever took place where there's something he saw, mm -hmm. it caused him to ask the question, unto what were you baptized, you know? And so I, I think that when you look at it that way, he, he, he saw them as disciples. Yes. So they were doing something. They were followers. That, yes, yeah. Mm -hmm. You know, and mm -hmm. so, and, and to come, <coughs> like I said, it, it's revealed mm -hmm. they were followers of John, and mm -hmm. John, you know, talking mm -hmm. about the Messiah, mm -hmm. but not fully understanding that, mm -hmm. hey, look, uh, they, and I, obviously they knew Jesus had died, mm -hmm. you know, at this mm -hmm. time because the world had, but they mm -hmm. more or less like were still incomplete. Yes. They hadn't heard yes. the full story. They haven't mm -hmm. heard the preaching that, like, uh, the Peter gospel. preached on yes. the day of Pentecost. That's right. You know, that's right. And so that, that's what was missing yes. in their... Uh, and that's, uh, Tony, I'm glad you mentioned that. That's a very good point because they didn't have CNN. They didn't have YouTube. They didn't have emails. You know, a lot of the gospel at this time was spread by word of mouth, by caravan, by people telling them of what happened in Jerusalem, uh, by w pretty much human beings talking about this. And so the, the, the gospel part aspect just hadn't gotten to them yet. They probably somewhere earlier heard Apollos preach and he was saying there was a baptism of repentance, a baptism of repentance, a baptism of repentance. You know, he was teaching what he knew at that time. We know uh, Priscilla and Aquila, you know, pulled him aside, but somewhere he had maybe taught hundreds of people, because remember, he was a powerful man, mighty in the scriptures, an eloquent man, fervent in the spirit. So there were people that were roaming around that were still following Apollos' old teaching. Mm -hmm. And I believe in the text that that's the group or one of the groups that Paul ran into. And he just looked at their life and they said, wait a minute, you guys are, there, there, there's something missing here. But Jim. It's just it's amazing how the, how the Holy Spirit is in all working through all this yes. and all these puzzles just putting together. First, mm -hmm. you have to get a polis, mm -hmm. you know, liquid speaker, mm -hmm. everything, and, 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 and you're educated. And you have these two people, Quill and Priscilla. Mm -hmm. I don't know what they were, they were tent makers, but yet yes. they had the truth yes. to educate him. Yes. And then from that, you can see the, the consequences of Apollos' teaching with these group of people that Paul encountered. It shows why he had to, the, the Apollos had to get the right understanding mm -hmm. because this is what was going on with his preaching. Mm -hmm. You have people going along thinking it was baptized mm -hmm. when it wasn't baptized. Mm -hmm. And you see how the Holy Spirit has worked through, the, worked through this whole deal mm -hmm. as the church is growing. Mm -hmm. And so all these events is happening, we know they happen for a reason. That's right. but, it, but it's, it's just as it, important today mm -hmm. as it was mm -hmm. now. Amen. Yeah. Amen. And, and you know, we know that you're speaking of Priscilla and Aquila and the Holy Spirit. Remember we said today that some people actually call the book of Acts the Acts of the Holy Spirit. And you read it through. I mean, we know what the title is in our translation, but you could see the Holy Spirit all through the book of Acts. And that goes back to what Jim is saying about Priscilla and Aquila because they met Paul where? In Corinth. And then Paul had this feast, I must needs go to Jerusalem, so he left them where? In Ephesus. But the fact that Priscilla and Aquila were in um, Corinth, and we read, if you remember the text from that lesson a week ago, that they were there because of the expulsion of the Jews out of what? Rome by who? Claudius. So the fact that God put these people in Paul's life at that time 
and they also happened to be tent makers. We don't know how they hooked up with Paul, but maybe it was because they had, the, the Bible says they had the same craft. They were tent makers. They started talking, and Paul just on fire. They're on fire. The next thing you know, they start clicking. We don't know. But what we do see is how the Holy Spirit is moving and how he is uh, helping the Priscilla and Aquila. And before they even met Paul, they had already run across Apollos mm -hmm. and had already sat down with him, already teaching. And, 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 and this man humbled himself because he was really educated. He was up there. And he humbled himself and he began, the Bible says, to uh, convince the Jews in the, in the synagogue that Jesus was the Christ. So at some point, he, his, his doctrine, he, he, he got it. He learned. He says, oh, man, I, I, I missed all this stuff. I missed the cross. I missed the Holy Spirit. I, mi I, I missed the death, the burial, the resurrection. I'm just preaching what John was preaching. And so then once he got that, he turned into a completely different person. Now, another aspect that we focused on, not to belabor it, um, we talked about the school of Tyrannus and who Tyrannus was. I just, I, that kind of stuff interests me. <laughs> so I had to do a little search on who Tyrannus was and, you know, this school. And there's, I didn't say it in the lesson today, but there were some uh, other manuscripts that were not accepted that, that, that kind of elaborated a little bit. And they said that they believed that, that Tyrannus rented the school to, to Paul and Paul had it from like, 11 in the day till 4 in the afternoon, which was the hottest parts of the day. And those were the days that Tyrannus was not speaking because he only spoke in the mornings and the evenings. I didn't put none of that in the sermon because none of that's in the Bible. <laughs> but, you know, it, it, it's fascinating when you start studying and you start learning and you start, you know, you can decide what, which parts you want to accept and which parts you don't. But the school of Tyrannus here is important to me because Paul stays there. It, it becomes his headquarters. It becomes his rented building. It becomes his church. Mm -hmm. not, not in a sense that he owns it, but every morning, every day, every week, you know where Paul is at. Mm -hmm. Just like every week, people know we're going to be assembled here at Palomar. Paul, that was, that, was, that was where he had worship at. Mm -hmm. And so I felt, given the time, the amount of time, that he was there in Ephesus and that all of it pretty much, at least from what we could tell, the majority of it was coming out of the school of Tyrannus. To me, that's not a small item. That's not something to just gloss over. It's just something we file in our filing cabinet and, and maybe we never need to know or anything. But whenever people do ask me about uh, why don't you see church buildings in the scriptures, there's two things I always ask them or try to try to elaborate or educate them on, is number one is a persecution. You couldn't come to Palomar like this. And they were arresting people. It was Caesar worship back then. It was the only uh, authorized, not the only, but one of the few authorized uh, excuse me, religious practice, practices that were uh, allowed by the Hellenists. When I say Hellenists, I'm talking about mainly the Greek and Roman culture was Judaism. It was, it was legal. But the way this Christianity, oh, no, 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 it was, it was not legal. That's why when we were in the previous lesson and we looked at the decision by Gallio, remember Gallio? What happened with Gallio? And Sosthenes and Crispus, and they wanted, they wanted Paul, they wanted them to stop Paul from preaching, and Paul went over next door to the synagogue to the house of Justin, because they tried to stop the Apostle Paul and they went all the way up to, to, uh, to Gallio. Is it Gallio or Gaius? I think it's Gallio. And, and they tried to argue a case before. He was like the supreme case. He's like the governor of the state of California. And he says, if this was about some, some law or lewdness, he says, I could see. He said, but you talk about names and dates, this stuff that's in your law. He says, I don't want anything to do with this. That decision meant that they had to leave Paul alone because Gallio basically sanctioned the preaching of the gospel in that area. It was a huge decision. It was huge. And so we don't, we don't want to gloss over and miss these, these fine details because, once again, we see, Jim, the Holy Spirit. We see the Holy Spirit working. We see how it's... And they got so mad, they took Sosides. <laughs> they just beat that man up. <laughs> they beat him up. But then later, you go into 1 Corinthians chapter number 1, I believe... 
uh, and, and, and Paul says, to Sosthenes, our brother. He became one too. So Crispus and Sosthenes came over to Christ Jesus. Brother Tony. I, I was going to bring out um, where Alicia was talking about uh, speaking evil of the way. And um, more or less that the synagogue, or she mentioned congregation. So the synagogue, it was the Jews that were basically doing this and not the disciples of, right. of Christ. It was, you know, because he, he went into the synagogue disputing <clears throat> with the Jews. Mm-hmm. He went in there trying to mm-hmm. enlighten them about God's word. Amen. And so Amen. Um, that's, that's where that was uh, taking place. Yes. Uh, I was just going to say to the part of, you were talking about Tyrannius. We know that there's history out there. Mm-hmm. But, but we keep it in our mind. I, I, I think that as long as we know that and we separate it, mm-hmm. that this is not the word. Yeah. But so history, it doesn't apply. <laughs> but history gives you some insight to yes, some sir. things. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. And so when you, yes, when, when you know that, mm-hmm. what we do know is Jesus said, look, I gave you all mm-hmm. you need mm-hmm. pertaining Amen. to your salvation. Amen. So when you have the question, why did he put in there the school of time? <laughs> <laughs> That's right. <laughs> <laughs> you know, Why did he put that yeah, in there? That's you, right. You know, so there's some information. You know, it may not, you know, it, it, that, it's not that God wrote everything in the Bible. I gave Amen. you a word because mm-hmm. the Bible even teaches every word that Christ spoke. Mm-hmm. There's not enough books in this world that That's it can right. contain it. That's but right. he gave us what we need. That's right. We do have these historical books that provide right. some information when you want yes. to know, like you said, the background. Mm-hmm. or what's going on, so, or it may enlighten you about some of the customs and things that were going mm-hmm. on mm-hmm. to say, oh, okay, now mm-hmm. I can see. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. You know. Amen. Amen. That's very good. Very good point, Tony. I would only add one more thing that what, what Brother Tony was saying was that, uh, you know, at this point, you're right, it was primarily a religious persecution, primarily, except for one place, which right about now, all you know what is breaking out. And that's back in Thessalonica. Because we're at a point now where Paul is starting to write letters. We just haven't covered them, but we're in Acts chapter number 19 now. Paul is writing a few letters. As a matter of fact, we believe that Galatians may have been written already. We believe that James may have been written already. We believe that uh, First and Second Thessalonians may have been written by the time you get to this time, if, uh, Acts 19, if they haven't been written yet, he's about to write them. That's all in the same time period. So that means that the Christians in Thessalonica, they are facing a government type of revolt, not just from the Jews. And that's why in the Thessalonian letter, when Paul writes to them, he deals with a very heavy subject, which is eschatology, which is the study of end times, because their biggest fear and their, what Paul is hearing that the people in Thessalonica believe that, well, the persecution was so bad for them, let me back up, that they believed that they had missed the second coming. Paul writes them a letter. That's the, the, the core, it's the subject of First Thess- Thessalonians. And he gets a little deeper in 2 Thessalonians. And if you read 2 Thessalonians carefully, you will see that um, there was forgeries, mm-hmm. or at least one forgery. But there were forgeries going around in Thessalonica, supposedly being letters from Paul. That's when he started to say, I've written this with my own hand. Because he was authenticating that, hey, this is me, Paul writing to you in Thessalonica, and he talks about the end times, he talks about the second coming, he talks about holding on to Christ, he, he, no man knoweth the hour, you know, everything he writes to them, he's speaking to this, this, this heavy issue, which uh, many people that have studied either Paul or Thessalonians say that for, for that to be one of Paul's earliest letters, he dealt with a very heavy subject that we still study to this day, and that was uh, first, first and second Thessalonians. Thessalonians and Galatians may have been written right now too. So he was reading about those foolish Galatians and that 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 uh, that uh, false gospel that they had heard of. <clears throat> so another thing I wanted to go to while we have a little bit of time left was the concept of laying on of hands. And we talked about this, and this is just me. These categories right here. 
this is what I can see so far, and there's probably more. Again, uh, this is not an exhaustive study, so, so if you find more scriptures or everything, that's fine. Uh, but just when I did take a look at it, I found that the laying on hands roughly fall, fell into three categories. The first one was the transfer of guilt to the sacrifice. The second one was commissioning of a godly responsibility or authority. And then the third one we see in the healing of the sick. There's probably one or two more you may find, and this could grow over time. Uh, but initially, as I mentioned, that's what I, that's what I found. So Leviticus chapter number 1, verse number 4, we see the transfer of the guilt from the sinner to the sacrifice or burnt offerings. These, are, these bullets are paraphrases by me because I was kind of going through this part uh, a little bit fast. Now, in Leviticus 1, 4, it's dealing with the individual. But in Leviticus 16, it's dealing with the nation. So in this one, both hands were to be laid on the scapegoat, and we have a lesson there called the one that got away. Mm -hmm. And you guys that were here remember that there were two goats, and they had one facing the people and one facing the other way when you, when you set them up in front of the temple. And then one was sacrificed, and then one was taken by a man out into the wilderness, and he was set free. That was the scapegoat. And the sins were transferred to the scapegoat. Uh, uh, well, the sins uh, were transferred to uh, the one that was sacrificed. And then there was the other one that was set free, which kind of uh, talked about redemption and how uh, there should be some way for mankind to get back to God. It's a wonderful, wonderful study. I think we uh, take the scapegoat lightly. But if you ever get a chance to really look through that, it's, it, there's so many implications to what Christ did on the cross, and, and it's just a wonderful study. Then in Numbers chapter 27, uh, verse 23, we see Moses laying his hands upon Joshua in front of Eleazar the priest. Uh, this was done to commission this young Joshua to a new godly responsibility. So the disciples, when we get to Acts 6, they knew this. Mm -hmm. They knew Numbers 27. They, they had studied that in, out, up, and down. They probably were taught that since they were small children. <clears throat> then the second aspect of it, we see the commissioning of godly responsibility or passing of authority. And I say here, bullet number one, no doubt the apostles being studied in the Old Testament scriptures adopted this practice in the coronation of deacons. We use that word deacons, but it's servants in Acts chapter number six, verse number six. And in Acts 18, uh, 8, I'm sorry, 17 and 18, then laid their hands on them. This is the actual text. And they received the Holy Ghost. And when Simon saw that through the laying on of the apostles' hands the Holy Ghost was given, he offered them money. So once again, we see in the New Testament, in the New Testament, that's two items so far that we see of the laying on on the hands. And then Acts chapter number 13, this is right when uh, the Holy Spirit on the first missionary journey of the apostle Paul says, separate unto me Paul and Bonerus for the work. Oh, there it is in the text. I, bullet three. Acts 13, 2 and 3, commissioning Paul and crew for the first missionary journey. As they ministered to the Lord and fasted, the Holy Ghost said, Separate me, Barnabas and Paul, Barnabas and Saul, for the work whereof I have called them. And when they had fasted and praised and laid their hands on them, they sent them away. So now we have three instances in the New Testament where we see the laying on of hands. The fourth one was here. In Acts chapter number 19, verse number 6. And then we see it again when later when Paul is preaching to this young preacher, uh, uh, educating this young preacher, Timothy, in 1 Timothy chapter number 4, verse 13 and 14. He says, Till I come, give attendance to reading, to exhortation, to doctrine. Neglect not the gift that is in thee, which was given to thee by prophecy with the laying on of hands of the presbytery. And then we see item number 6 is uh, 2 Timothy, the next letter, uh, chapter number 1, verse 6 and 7, Wherefore I put thee in remembrance that thou stir up the gift of God which is in thee by the putting on of hands, for God hath not given us the spirit of fear, but of power and of love and a sound mind. And then we see the warning going back to 1 Timothy chapter number 5, of verse 21 and 22, I charge thee therefore before God 
and the Lord Jesus Christ and the elect and angels, that thou observe these things without preferring one before another, doing nothing by partiality. Lay hands suddenly. And here it's more of the uh, commissioning or more of the acknowledgement. Lay hands or don't acknowledge uh, suddenly on no man, neither be partaker of other men's sins, but keep thyself what? Pure. Don't get caught up with what other, other people are doing and what they're going on with, and be careful about laying your hands on. Now, I went to Judges 1620, uh, and I related to this a little bit only in that, uh, and this is one day, Lord willing, there'll be a sermon, and Samson knew not that the Spirit of the Lord had departed from him. And I think that is so important because uh, some of us will go around and believe that we're doing things in the name or with the authority of God, and we don't even know, like Samson, we was the strong man in the group. Amen, somebody. But the Spirit of the Lord had departed Samson, and he didn't even know. Wait a minute, Brother Keith. He woke up that morning, Brother Tony put his cape on, and he thought he was still going to go out there and be the same man he was a week ago. And he did not know that the Spirit of the Lord... I believe that that's a really powerful text. Yeah. Uh, and it's just something for us to, to contemplate. And then another related one was Matthew 7, verse 15 and 16, beware of false prophets. I didn't go into this one too much, but it was related to uh, 1 Timothy 5, 21 and 22 about not laying hands suddenly on no man. Beware of false prophets which come unto you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are what kind of wolves? Ravaging wolves. Ye shall know them, how? How did Paul notice something with these people in Ephesus? There was no fruit. Somewhere in there, Brother Tony, Paul said, wait, Paul said, wait a minute. We ain't got no love up in here. But, but, but they, didn't, they didn't have no long suffering. They didn't have no gentleness. They weren't meek with one another. They had no self-control. They had no peace. Paul said, wait a minute. What, what, what did you receive? They said, we never heard of it. And so we wonder today when we see people around if they have ever heard of the Holy Spirit. But Tony. Um, as you were sitting there reading uh, uh, 16 there of Matthews, uh, you shall know them by their fruits. You know, and Jesus tells us we shall know the tree by its fruit and stuff. And I, it just made me think how important that is for us as Christians as we walk our Christian life. Yeah. And who, you know, just as Paul recognized there was something about those disciples, yes. if we're looking at the fruit of people mm -hmm. to protect ourselves from certain things, yes. when we yes. look and say, well, this is not of God, mm -hmm. we, you know, because we do, we live in this world, the Bible tells us, we're to be in the world, but not of it. Mm -hmm. and, and sometimes, are we really monitoring? Are we monitoring mm -hmm. the fruit or the people that are around us to know, mm -hmm. you know, our interactions to make sure that um, this doesn't take hold of us? You That's know, right. when, when we see that God is telling them, look, you stay away from those people. Mm -hmm. It wasn't that he wanted, uh, you know, his whole plan was to save them all. Yeah. Right. But he understood about influence and influence into our lives. And so that's just what made me, you know, you hear that, made me think of that. Go ahead, Sister Lee. And then uh, piggy, well, not quite piggybacking off of that, but also um, something to think about. I think nowadays the scripture would be looked over often because the emphasis there was that, well, not the emphasis, but the part that people probably most often see is that Paul was saying, like, do you guys know who the Holy Spirit is. Yeah. And so now a lot of people might be like, well, yeah, you know, yeah, yeah, I know yeah. what it is. So like, you know, this doesn't apply to me. Like, yeah, I know yeah, what yeah. the Holy Spirit is. Like, boom, like, I'm not like these people. Right. But right. that the actual emphasis is not on just the fact that they didn't know who the Holy Spirit was, mm -hmm. but why it was yes. that Paul came to that conclusion. Yes. That's and right. that's the part that still applies today. Exactly. Because it's not that... Again, that difference in the way. It's not just that you believe something or mm. that you have knowledge mm. of something, but it was mm. that I could look at your lifestyle Life. yes. and see, see that 
you may yes. have thought that you believed yes. something, mm-hmm. right. but that your actions didn't back up that fact. Right. And yes, that, that right. you did not, in fact, have the Holy Spirit. Because, I mean, they do say that they didn't know what it was. Yes. But that's also yes. evident in the way that they lived they, because mm-hmm. though that fruit was not was evident not in them. That's and so right. that's our part today. Like, are these fruits of the Spirit right. evident in us? Yes. And if so, then, like, do we really know the Holy Spirit? Like, do we know... Mm-hmm. Do we know him intimately or like do you have like an intellectual yes. knowledge of him only? Yes. Yeah, like a download of data. That's why we kind of ended the lesson today. It said if Paul walked into this building, exactly. would he see the Holy Spirit in us? Would he see the fruit of the Spirit in us? And I like where you guys were going because I just jumped back to Acts chapter number six uh, and I went to verse number three. And this is when they had the issue with the uh, daily administration, the Grecians against the Hebrews and the widows. But it said something in there about the men that they were to choose in Acts 6.3. Wherefore, brethren, look ye out among you seven men Mm -hmm. of what? Honest report, full of the Holy Ghost and wisdom, who we may appoint over this matter. So look at the fruit. And when we look at the concept of of Christ, because everything is built on an Old Testament construct, and we look at the concept of the fruit, did you guys know where we went in the Old Testament, where where we looked that up, where we first saw that? You guys remember? It has to do with Moses, and it had to do with some problems in the camp. And it has to do around the time Kadesh. of the rebellion of Korah. Kadesh. In Kadesh, yes, that's part of it. But it has to do, what, Jim? Where they were all questioning if Moses was the leader. And then God was upset. You remember that? Yep. He says, every tribe, there's 12. Every tribe have a man bring a, a staff. And he said, in the morning, the man that I choose, his staff will what? Bud. Bud. Yeah. And it was Aaron's. And then depending on your version, if you, if, if, if you look at the text carefully, it said a yielded ripe fruit. I always look at that stuff. Wait a minute. Means it, it wasn't green, Brother Jim. <laughs> Didn't have no spots on it, Brother Dash. It, it, it was like, oh, man, this is, this is juicy. This is perfect. It was perfectly right. That's why when we, we go over the book of Acts, we'll get there when we start talking about elders in Acts chapter number 20. It says the Holy, the Holy Spirit makes elders. The Holy Spirit makes an elder. The Holy Spirit starts working on this man when he's 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19. And we always, not always, but a lot of times, we go over to Titus, we go to Timothy, we hold up this checklist against the person, and we, we try to make this person so perfect, so holier than now, that Paul couldn't even qualify to be an elder. Yeah, we, mm-hmm. we, we, we try to do that, but when the Holy Spirit is involved, and the Holy Spirit has been working on that man, and the Holy Spirit prepared that man, by the time you get to the man, and the time for him to be selected as an elder, it's an academic process. Amen. You'll just look, yep, there, there he goes. <laughs> there he is right there. He's sitting right there. Because the Holy Spirit has made yes. elders. And we, people, man, the church, we try to make elders. Mm-hmm. No, sir, no man. We're going to get there. We, we, one more chapter. <laughs> we'll be there. We'll be there. Acts chapter number 20. But, but the Holy Spirit makes elders. And this yes. goes back to the, the ripening or the yielding of the fruit. And that's where Jesus and Paul speak, by their fruit, you shall know them. God selected Aaron and Moses as the priestly line. Yeah. By the fruit, you shall know them. And that got carried over right into, right into the New Testament. We are four minutes over. <laughs> uh, any last thoughts or comments? And Brother Keith, you've been quiet, so I'm going to pick on you and ask you to pray your heart for a closing <laughs> prayer. Uh, we have some people that are going to be traveling this week, 
and we want to certainly pray for them. Uh, but are there any final thoughts, comments, or prayer requests? Okay, okay. Yes. Still be on Zoom on Tuesday. Amen. Amen. <laughs> okay. Uh, if there are no closing thoughts or comments, are there any prayer requests? Pray for me and my family. Okay. Sister Duncan, pray for family and her. Brother Keith? Brother Gerald. Yes, Brother Gerald. I talked to Brother Gerald last night. He's, he's doing better. Julie is better than him. Uh, he still has... You know, the cough, he was coughing when we were on the phone, but uh, he's, he's, he's coming. <laughs> he's coming along, so we, we just continue to pray for Brother Gerald de- dealing, with the, dealing with COVID. Uh, anybody else, any prayer requests? I also talked to uh, Sister Monique in Texas, continue to pray for her. Uh, talk to Sister Paula, continue to pray for her. I talked to Sister Claudia, Claudia uh, Vas- um you know what I'm talking about, Sister Claudia. They're doing fine. I just, you know, called her. Hey, sis, I ain't seen you in a minute. So, you know, it's, it's time to give you that phone call. <laughs> but is there anybody else, any other prayer requests? Okay. Uh, it's five after, Brother Keith. Do you mind closing this word of prayer? Yes. Dear Heavenly Father, we'd like to thank you for this day that you have given us. My Heavenly Father has been blessed. It's good to hear, get your word, be in your word. It's good to come together with the brethren and the sisters to worship you in spirit and in truth. Manly Father, we ask right now as we come to your throne of grace that you be with our brothers that are traveling this week. Be with them on the way up and on the way back and through Whatever they have to go to do, my Heavenly Father, be with them. Heavenly Father, I ask for you to bless the sick and the shut-in right now that are at home, my Heavenly Father, and wishing to be here, but they just can't. Hug them and touch them, my Heavenly Father. Give them peace. Let them know that you, they're still loved. We miss them. My Heavenly Father, I ask right now that you be in the house, the household of faith right now, and you just... Go through, my Heavenly Father, touching the brothers and sisters and let them know, my Heavenly Father, that they are loved. My Heavenly Father, I ask right now that you touch Brother Gerald. I ask that you touch Sister D's family. I ask that you be with them, my Heavenly Father. Brother Gerald and went through a lot. Sister D has been going through a lot. My Heavenly Father, just be with them. My Heavenly Father, I ask that you be with all my brothers and sisters right now who are just going through the day, praising your name, doing your will, and uplift us and keep us, my Heavenly Father. I'd like to give thanks for your son, your precious gift of salvation, Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior, my Heavenly Father. Thank you for that. My Heavenly Father, I ask right now that as we part our ways, that you be with us through the rest of this day, through this night. Have thy angels be about us and guard us and keep us. As we go through the week, my Heavenly Father, let our light so shine that people will know that we are children by our love. My Heavenly Father, we give this prayer to you in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. In his holy name, amen.